Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Graduate School of Business. Uh, it's great to be here. This book launch is a bit like the Gupta wedding, absent vertically of Air Force Base, uh, because you, you know, it consists of several parts. And we start off earlier today. Jeremy and Andrea had to suffer me at the press club, and here you all are tonight on this cold and wintry Cape evening. And tomorrow we're at the waterfront. If you get, you haven't had enough, you can always come there. Uh, at, at tomorrow evening, and, and then we go to Franschhoek, where I know some of you uh, bibliophiles will be over the weekend, and then we're going to Durban and Joburg next week to do the same thing. And, uh, you know, as Jeremy was saying, all those nice and kind things about me, and uh, of the four books I've written, I have to say three have been with Jonathan Ball Publishers, and it's been a really most enriching and rewarding experience because they do take books and ideas and all the things Jeremy spoke about very sincerely, and they execute very professionally. But I was thinking about, you know, his, his real experience of me as opposed to how I was presented, perhaps, uh, through the lens of the media, not always forgiving, as we know. And it reminded me of what, you know, Groucho Marx once said. He said, they've, uh, I have inner beauty, but they've never developed a ca camera which has been able to capture it. And <laughs> I, I mentioned that because one of the things about Mandela, which is much in the text I write about and between the lines that you'll all hopefully go out and buy after this uh, address this evening, is that Mandela had an almost preternatural ability to size you up and to try and bring you in. In fact, I used to, I had so many of these Mandela moments when I was leader of the DP and it was objectively a very small party of seven members of parliament in 1994 until he left in 1999 perhaps because he left, we became much larger. He grew sixfold after he left uh, Parliament, and they've grown double that in the last election. Um, that Mandela's, uh, I used to say to my colleagues after another session with a great man, either at his home or in his office, I said, you know, it's a bit like that movie Fatal Attraction, uh, because you get so seduced. And actually one of his, uh, the man who ghost wrote his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, Richard Stengel, made the point that although Mandela would have hated the term, he actually was the great seducer. And not because, you know, he wanted to have a physical or intimate relationship with you long before same-sex couplings became uh, acceptable and kosher in this country and the rest of the world, but because he wanted to persuade you rather than to force you or inform you that his ideas were right and perhaps yours needed some correction. And there are a lot of instances of that uh, in the relationship that we had. Now, you might then say, well, you know, Alice Spike Milligan, who wrote that famous book, Hitler, My Role in His Downfall, you know, this might be accused of being Mandela, My Role in His Rise, this opposite Mandela. But it did occur to me in my discussions with Jeremy and the founding and moving spirit of Jonathan Ball Publishers, the eponymous Jonathan Ball himself, that of all the many narratives, and some of them are quite excellent, the authorized biography by Anthony Sampson, the unauthorized biography by Martin Meredith, the many other books, some of which I've consulted. My friend John Carlin wrote one just after he died called Knowing Mandela. Very interesting narrative as well. That no one, not a single person, and only really a handful of us who could have written it, had actually written a book about Mandela and his relationship, not with those in the Binnakring, as we used to say in South Africa, but who were in the opposition. And of course, on the Woody Allen aphorism that most of your success in life is about showing up, I showed up. It wasn't an overcrowded field. There were exactly two of us out of seven MPs who wanted the job as the leader of the DP literally within days of Mandela's election as president of South Africa. But even before then, when I was a backbench member of parliament elected in 1989 for the constituency of Houghton, as I recall in the chapter called The Dinner, I got this famous phone call one night on the answering machine. Shows you how long ago it was. We've had cell phones. And it was, you know, the most famous recently arrived resident in my constituency of Houghton, a man called Nelson R. Mandela, who was on the line inviting me to his home for dinner. And that was in August 1992. And literally from that meeting right up until my retirement 
from party leadership in 9, 2006, 2007, we, we had this relationship which was sometimes very close, sometimes very fractious, sometimes quite hostile. And it's not because he was the president and I was leader of one of the several opposition parties in South Africa that gave the objective uh, circle that relationship they did. It was also how the interactions happened and around some of those great and extraordinary issues that we grappled with then and grapple with still today and tonight and which don't even admit of resolution right now. And I try and canvas those in this book. Now, I need to also reflect on the fact that uh, we're in South Africa at a stage where there have been two remarkable mileposts, as it were, in just the last five months. The first, of course, on the 5th of December last year was the death of Nelson Mandela. The second was what happened last week, the fifth democratic general election in South Africa. And very few, in my opinion, free democracies present quite the paradox like today's South Africa. And indeed, the South Africa that Mandela in so many personal and political and statesmanlike ways bequeathed to us. We are a free democracy with a black majority government, but one of the most racially unequal countries in the world. The state is engulfed with mushrooming corruption, which our free media vigorously reports. Our multiracial elite shops in those bling first world palaces, like you've got just down the road here in the waterfront, and millions of our South Africans live in shacks. Our ruling party last week won a huge victory. I mean, do not, as George W. Bush would say, misunderestimate the fact <laughs> that for all the advances made by my old party, there is still a 40-point difference after 20 years, 40 points, separating the ruling party and the chief opposition party. And let me add parenthetically that actually for all the very considerable achievements of the DA, and I don't want to minimize them, they're really in the teeth of a lot of objective demographic difficulties, they did very well last week. But you've got to say that after 20 years, the opposition total, in other words, the numbers who voted for any opposition party have not budged at all since 1994. Admittedly, the composition of that opposition has radically rearranged itself. But if you think about it further, the parliament that I entered in May 1994 was actually more oppositional to the ruling party than the parliament will be when it gathers together next week. Because the very simple fact that 10% of the parliamentary total in 1994 consisted of the Encarta Freedom Party, which was on issues like federalism, free enterprise, in a different universe from the ANC, whereas today, Nearly a third of the opposition total is represented by another version of the ANC, admittedly more radical and populist, in the form of Julius Malema's EFF. So you could actually, with the same set of figures, say, well, the overall strength of opposition as an ideology or as a contrast of ideas is actually less than it was in 1994. And certainly the DA is much less of an advocate of free market, federalism, those other ideas of individual freedom today than it was back then. Arguably it's much more successful than it was then, so maybe there's something to be said for that adaptiveness as well. But what I'm trying to say is actually for in terms of ideology and ideas and policy contestation, the gap is probably even wider than it was back then. And then we have this other extraordinary phenomenon that between January and Election Day we had over 3,000 service delivery protests in South Africa, most of them violent. And I don't want to slag anyone off, but there's a not brilliant TV station called ANN7. But they had the best graphic on election day, or the day after election day, where they actually showed you the hotspots. How did the hotspots vote? Marikana, Rustenburg, Stack Sprite, um, Be Beckersdal, all those places I visited. I used to know them because I went there as a, to canvas votes and give speeches. And actually every single one of them, by a fairly hefty margin, voted ANC. 
Now, the, admittedly, the percentages were down and uh, all that, but they were still, by a very comfortable margin, electing the ANC in those areas. And, you know, it, it's this fantastic disconnect between people who will go and burn down an ANC councillor's house and then a few days later go and vote for the party that sent that councillor to them. And that is part of what I call our paradox. And it says to you that the brand in South Africa, the political brand, you know, I come from a Manchester United household. And notwithstanding all the leadership churn, you know, Alex Ferguson, David Moyes, Giggs, whoever knows it comes after him. Um, you know, the people still go to the old Trafford and shout for the Red Devils. And the same to a great extent, although there's some very interesting subtext of the voting happens on election day. And you know all the facts that South Africa actually has, despite all the protests and all the unhappiness objectively a huge amount of delivery three million homes have been delivered since 1994 66 percent of home cooking in south africa is done now with electricity and something like uh, 50 percent 90 percent of homes have access to a uh, piped water and then of course there are those other two facts which in terms of delivering more social justice are absolutely irrefutably a good thing, and that is that 16 million poor South Africa, not 16 million people, but there are 16 million poor South African households that receive social grants, but that is done on the back of just 6 million taxpayers. And then the other crowning irony is that, and appropriate to say this in a business school context, but I do say it outside of business schools as well, is that the South African private sector scores in the top percentiles of all global indices in the world on everything from the regulation of our securities exchange to the uh, solidity of our banking sector. We have Mrs. Jennifer Herman here, not herself directly involved, but her husband Hughes, a very distinguished bank banker in South Africa. And we have, of course, some globally competitive companies which have all emerged since 1994, and yet in the public sector, we spend a greater percentage of our GDP on education, on public education, 6% of GDP, and the results are equivalent to those achieved in Yemen, which is a failed state. And you know, I always, um, some people have heard this before, you know, I'm married to an Israeli and we have two, we have an Israeli household, I always say, I have great sympathy for the Palestinians because I know it's like to live under Israeli occupation. <laughs> But I have to tell you on two things that uh, Israel beats South Africa, maybe some others as well. The one is that actually even in the beleaguered West Bank of Palestine, when we last were part of that index, you get a bit of maths and science education than you do here. And uh, I did notice, I couldn't help but notice that only today, since we have plummeted so precipitously down or up the corruption index since Mandela left office, we were 34th out of 177 countries, pretty good place, top third in perceptions of corruption, we are now on 77th position and dropping. I couldn't help but notice the prime, former Prime Minister of Israel, Ehud Olmert, went to jail today for bribery and corruption to join the former President of Israel, Mr. Katsef, who's, in, who's been jailed for raping some of his subordinates. Now that doesn't happen in South Africa because the more politically high up you are, the less chance you have, except your name is Malema, of being touched by the criminal justice system. So what does all this mean? Well, you know, one of the Woody Allen uh, quotes that I most like is most of your success in life is about showing up. So, you know, I showed up at the time that Mandela became the president and that led to this happy relationship in the book. But another chap who showed up here was Bill Keller, who was dispatched by the New York Times to be the bureau chief in Johannesburg at the moment that Mandela was released. And he, of course, like many other people, left South Africa after a few years and then became the editor-in-chief of the New York Times, quite an important job. And uh, last year he revisited South Africa through the pages of the New York Review of Books, at least, and he said, if South Africa does not leave you full of ambivalence, you have not been paying attention. It is inspiring and it is dispiriting. And I actually think, you know, you have all these endless arguments. Is the glass half full? Is it half empty? Are we doing well? Are we doing badly? The simple answer is both. And you can find, and I've found, and this book perhaps reflects that, plenty of evidence of why we're teetering, as 
Jeremy's uh, distinguished father, Alex, Dr. Alex Berain, said, you know, on the eve of being a failed state. But plenty of other evidence that actually the country is showing a certain amount of vigor and health that actually and ironically was not around in Mandela's time. Now that might sound like a, a rather radical statement to make and I hope that I justified it uh, in terms of the book. And, uh, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the factors I think that uh, has changed in South Africa is this. And that was that during the Mandela presidency, and I was in Parliament for the Mandela presidency, oh, actually, I've been around so long, de Klerk, my first day in Parliament was de Klerk detonated his thermonuclear explosion and the 2nd of February, you know, and the DP came along to Parliament and decided we were going to, you know, call for the release of Mandela and we were going to demand that there be negotiations and between all the parties and the ANC beyond ban. And then this conservative president of the National Party went and did everything that we'd called for for all the years of our existence, which rather left the DP marooned as to what it was going to do for the next four or five years. That's also in the book. And the answer is, you know, not too much because uh, when your policies get stolen by your opponents. So reminds me of something not in the book. At that 1994 election when the DP got all of 310,000 votes and 1.7% of the seats. I was not the leader, instead, if you're looking to blame someone, but it wasn't Zach de Beer's fault, it was the objective reality. And I got this phone call from my father in Durban. My, happily, my dad is still alive and it was a very, very interesting encounter. One of the many with Mandela was about a very notorious or famous judgment of my father's, which was actually extracted in the Sunday Times, about Andrew Zondo, which was led to a very, very interesting encounter with Mandela and his views, which I will not belabor, but uh, just to tell you this about my dad, he phones me up after the 94 election and we were licking our wounds and I hadn't yet become, he says, Tony, I don't understand it. Everyone I know voted for the DP and we did so badly. <laughs> oh, I said, Dad, I can explain that very easily. You know a hundred people in Durban and 20 million people went to vote. That's what happened. <laughs> so, um, but the reality was that in many ways, and I'm not talking just about the parliamentary opposition, with perhaps the exception of the DP, which is small, but the press, civil society, it was the very radiance of Mandela and what you might call Mandelaism, which almost blinded people to the fact that we were also involved in trying to establish a democracy. And we almost put so much faith in what uh, Tolstoy would call the good czar, that here we had this good and this great man, which Mandela undoubtedly is, as I hope my book reflects, that we could relax and needn't be too vigilant about some of the things that were starting to develop or which needed attention on, on our watch. And during Mandela's presidency, the parliamentary opposition was deeply fragmented. Civil society was still finding its feet after the long night of apartheid. The press, whose leading editors were mostly drawn from the minority, was at some crucial and quite decisive moments mute and off -side. And it was this radiance of Mandela's light, in many ways, which warmed our hearts, but sometimes blinded us to our roles, not as citizens, but to deepen our democracy. And in that respect, at least, there has been a sea change for the better today. Uh, you know, I deeply miss Mandela as much as I'm sure everyone in this audience does. But without the protection of what the economist calls Mandela's saintly aura, both the ruling party and its leaders will be more harshly judged. Difficult for them, perhaps, but much better, actually, for our long-term democratic prospects. And, you know, I have never believed, and I suppose I was the leader of the opposition for such a long time, that our presidents should be, you know, innocent until they're proven guilty. I think you've got to hold government, the head of government, to account. You've got to probe, you've got to be effective, you've got to be pretty relentless, you've got to be tough, because that's the role of the constitutional opposition. You're not there as a praise singer, and you're not there simply, you're there as good citizens, but you're also there with a constitutionally defined role. And we saw what happened at Mandela's funeral service at the FMB Stadium. We saw what happened directly after his burial at Kunu, where the NUMSA, the biggest trade union faction of Kasatu, broke away and disaffiliated from the ANC. Now, doubtless, I mentioned those 
huge gap between government and opposition. The ANC, ruling party, is going to be in power for many years to come, but there is a degree of normality that has settled on the country's politics since then. Uh, and I have a, a good friend of mine who also wrote a, a very good book, well, mine's a good book, but his is a good book, called Justice, called Edwin Cameron. And for all the bad appointments in South Africa, I've got to tell you that my two Roman law lecturers when I was at Wits were both friends of mine today. The one was called Carol Lewis, and she's on the Supreme Court of Appeal. And the other's name is Edwin Cameron. He's a constitutional court judge. So there have been some good public appointments in the last few years, and to be lectured by such extraordinary people is, 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 a great, uh, is, is a great thing. But Edwin made a very interesting speech at the Alan Payton Literary Awards last July, where he said, our polity is boisterous, rowdy, sometimes cacophonous, and often angry. That much is to be expected. But after nearly two decades, we have far more freedom, more debate, more robust and direct engagement than with each other, and certainly more practical, tangible social justice than we enjoyed 20 years ago. And I think that part of the equation is also true. So sometimes I know it gets very depressing and dispiriting, as the great Bill Keller says, but you must also draw some sustenance that that is part of the warp and woof of a democratic engagement. Now, if I was to say, and uh, you know, on the Woody Allen aphorism, you know, you meet a lot of people if you're in a particular position. In my uh, other Hudanichet, which Jeremy mentioned, I was the your ambassador to Argentina. I met a lot of interesting people there. Argentina produced some remarkably outsized individuals. I did tell Zuma when I came back, it's worse governed and more corrupt than we are. And I <laughs> happens to be the truth, not an ingrate. He laughed. He didn't offer me another appointment either after that. <laughs> but uh, I guess I wasn't looking for one. But, uh, you know, Argentina, misgoverned, corrupt, one of the most successful countries in the world economically in the 1930s, one of the least successful today, also produces remarkable individuals uh, from the great Lionel Messi to the first non-European Pope in the world, Francis II to the Queen Consort of the Netherlands, Maxima and a whole range of other very distinguished and very impressive individuals. But if you're in Argentina, like here, yeah, the whole world passes by. So one of the passes by was a chap called Al Gore, you might remember, you know, bringing all his rich and famous friends to go and look at the Antarctic. I tried to work out the footprint that all their jets at Asesa Airport left while they went to look at uh, the melting of the ice cap. And one of them was Tokyo Sekwali, who arrived from our shores in his own plane, I might tell you, without the government credit card. He added, well, that's all really. So we were at this event, my friend, the American ambassador, um, Vilma Martinez and you know, Al Gore and his famous friends and the Leons and a few other diplomats. So I met Al Gore and he was a pretty stiff guy. And you could understand why Americans said when they were polled, and Americans poll everything relentlessly, that you would rather have had a beer with George W. Bush, who does not drink incidentally, <laughs> than Al Gore who does. Because he is not a very warm and friendly chap. But that's not what I want to hear about Al Gore, you know, than sort of a bit of name dropping. What I wanted to say is that Al Gore did something remarkable. Not what he won the Nobel Prize for, which was climate change. But it was in December 2000, after he had won the election, the popular vote by half a million votes, and effectively had been robbed of his victory by one of the most partisan decisions ever by the United States Supreme Court, which divided 5-4 on the, its appointment. In other words, the five Republican-appointed justices voted in favor of Bush and the four Democratic justices voted in favor of Gore and reversed all of precedence to effectively award the election to, um, to Bush. And Al Gore, then, you know, what's he going to do? He made a concession speech, and he said, this is America. We put country before party. And those, to me, in terms of democratic sustenance, are among the most powerful words in one of the greatest democracies that the loser can ever make. So I was thinking about that when I was writing this book. This is South Africa. We put country before party. 
Can we say that? Well, in the Mandela era, you could say that on many, many things. So, when it came to the rule of law and the courts of law, Mandela was involved in a range of decisions that went against, and the most notorious of which was against another person I was involved in politics, and he gets a brief and unhappy mention in the book. His name is Dr. Louis Late. You might remember him. He also incidentally had the idea that his great and well-known personality would result in him becoming a major force in opposition politics. So he stood in 99 and got rewarded with two seats. Happened to someone else recently who also had an idea that her personality would translate into a lot of seats. But Louis Leite uh, did something else. He was the rugby chief. And notwithstanding the extraordinary Invictus moments of the 1995 World Cup, which are also canvassed in my pages, he decided to sue Mandela and the government for the inquiry that the government launched against the SA Rugby Union and his dictatorial leadership of it. And there was an old order judge called Willem van der Merwe who took it upon himself to agree with Leite's legal team and subpoena the president to come to court. And as I describe it, Mandela was outraged. It was the first time a president had ever, during the course of normal litigation, been obliged to give evidence. But he went and he gave the evidence. The court found against him, actually didn't believe his testimony, and he accepted the judgment. And Mandela said, I am doing this, or words the effect, not because I am not outraged, but because the supremacy of the courts is the most important thing. And Mandela did it again, just toward the end of his presidency, when his very good friend, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, produced the first report of the TRC. And Mandela's successor, as party president and soon to be president, Thabo Mbeki, went to court to try and suppress the findings that were adverse to the ANC. And F.W. de Klerk, also much featured in those pages of this book, went to court to try and expunge the findings that were adverse to him. And Mandela, in contrast, took the attitude, publish and be damned. So, and there are many other instances where Mandela put party before country because he was a normal human being. He was a partisan warrior. I found it quite ridiculous in Cindy that my old party had this Know Your DA campaign trying to graft Mandela onto the DA. Well, I can assure you, one racing certainty, I knew a bit about Mandela, that if Mandela had been alive and well last Wednesday, he would have given both his ballots to the ANC without thinking about it. And I think what happened, and this is another point, is that the DA wants to remember the latter Mandelas, the Mandela I've described to you now, constitutionalism, rule of law, inclusivity, broad reconciliation. That's part of Mandela. The ANC, which can claim Mandela like no other party can, wants to remember the early Mandelas, the struggle, the armed Resistance, Conto we Siswe, the Robin Island years, but they are more ambivalent about what you might call the latter Mandelaism. And, you know, there are two aspects of this which perhaps I should just mention, and then we can, uh, we can, we can throw it wide open. And that is that uh, a very leading member of the ANC National Executive in 2011. Uh, Mr. Romat Claudi, who is the Deputy Minister of Correctional Services, but leading lights on the NEC, said the following, and this is one of the many paradoxes of South Africa. We spend millions of rands promoting our constitutional wonderment of 1994 and the 1996 Constitution. And this is what a leading figure in the governing party said. He said, the constitutional transition, quote, was a victory for apartheid forces who wanted to retain white domination under a black government. This has been achieved, quote, by emptying the legislature and executive of real power and giving it to other constitutional institutions and civil society movements. Now, you know, that's very, <laughs> that's a repudiation of the, um, of the latter Mandela's. From the DA's perspective, kind of elides or whitewashes, ignores the fact, that on two of the fundamentals for the ANC and arguably South Africa to get to where it got to in 1994, the ANC embraced the armed struggle and economic sanctions against South Africa, both of which were root and branch deposed by Helen Sussman and the Progressive Party tradition, which the Democratic Alliance grew out of. So there you have it. And, you know, it was, uh, 
The same thing that happened as Mandela died. There was an enormous kerfuffle when one of the people, interesting book incidentally, written about Mandela, or more particularly not about Mandela, about the exile years by another Jonathan Ball uh, author called Mission, External Mission, the ANC in Exile by Stephen Ellis, where he got the original transcript of Mandela's biography or autobiography, which was smuggled out of prison, and said, well, actually, I can show you in the transcript that Mandela had a deep attachment to Marxist-Leninism, was an uncritical supporter of Soviet foreign policy during the 1950s and 60s, and, of course, he pointed out this was all expunged from Mandela's official biography. And people got very excited. You know what I thought? So what? Because certainly Mandela was a flexible and adaptive politician. He did what needed to be done to end the fiendish brand of minority rule as he saw it. But he certainly didn't govern this country as a communist. He certainly didn't embrace communist economics when he was president of South Africa. And he certainly didn't impose on South Africa a communist constitution. So I often think, you know, we get stuck in these debates, this label sticking, or stigma labeling, without actually looking at what the underlying reality is was. Let me conclude with this thought, if I might, since, uh, you know, most of my heart is in South Africa. The little bit of it that isn't is actually in Latin America. And uh, that's because I spent three very engaged years in Argentina. And uh, you would have noticed on the subject of books that last month we had the uh, passing of a genuine literary giant called Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And I couldn't help but think when I saw that he died that in some of the events, the chapters, the history I describe in my book opposite Mandela, that there was indeed a touch of the miracle and the wondrous about our transition, despite all the underlying realities and the graft and all the unsexy parts from apartheid to democracy here. But as Gabriel Garcia Marquez noted, magical realism isn't enough. Because if only you are remembered for your glorious past, for that sort of golden footnote that you once had, as we did in 1994, you might actually not make a compact with the future. And therefore I would say, if I might in conclusion, that we need to reimagine the future in South Africa and not succumb to the sclerosis of power, corruption and complacency. What Mandela did for us, and we did for ourselves, it was a combination, was to establish in South Africa, no less than it was in the United States over 250 years ago, what the Pilgrim Fathers called a shining city upon a hill. You might say right here that Mandela created that shining city under the mountain in the Parliament of South Africa. But we've got to have purposeful renewal. You're going to have hope. You can't look back, you've got to look forward. And Marquez, Gabriel Garcia Marquez expressed it best when he said, it is not true that people stop pursuing dreams because they grow old. They grow old because they stop pursuing dreams. And my great hope for us is that we keep pursuing that dream. Thank you very much. Now comes the interesting part. <laughs> Tony, thank you very much. Uh, we are now going to throw it open to questions uh, for Tony. We have about 10 or 15 minutes. I see a hand over there. Oh, we have a roving mic. That's excellent. Evening, Tony. It's on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that what you had in, in mind when you took up the post of being ambassador to Argentina that you put country first before party because for me um, I'm, I'm one of those who actually were questioning um, your patriotism in that for the years that you were at, at parliament you were vigorous in opposition against the, the ANC and suddenly here's uh, President Zuma coming and offering you a post that will force you to be sort of singing praises to 
ANC policies, because government policies are ANC policies. So is that, is that what you had in mind when you took up that post to say, I'm putting, I know this is an ANC sort of drive, but because I'm South African, I'm putting my country before the ANC, so I'm taking the post. Because for me, that was a contradiction of what you as Tony stood for. Yeah, well, that's a very good question. It was answered very fully in my last book, uh, The Accidental Ambassador, which is not here tonight, but I'm very happy to engage in it. You know, what President Zuma said to me when he offered me his appointment just before I left, he said, Tony, it is very important that the face of South Africa in the world is not just ANC faces. And I suppose there was arguably no one better than me to present a non-ANC face in the world. And that was the basis of the understanding. And actually, as what I do record in my book is that my very first meeting with Mandela after the election, not ones before, 1994, when he asked me to go and have breakfast with him at what was then called Frida Skier, now in Ardendal, his residence in Rondebosch, you know, he wanted to talk to me about our relationship uh, party to party. And I said, look, my predecessor, Zach de Beer, had, had to resign because we did so badly. And I think you'd make a great ambassador. And Mandela said to me, that's a great idea. You know, we should really make it. And so the first DP or DA ambassador was in, ironically, I never thought, uh, I didn't think much of the position myself, but I was, you know, then in Parliament, uh, was uh, created by Mandela of Zach de Beer. And there'd been some examples of that beforehand. Harry Schwartz was appointed by F.W. de Klerk from the opposition front bench as ambassador to Washington. So I, I don't think it's inapt for an opposition politician after they're no longer opposition. If, you, if you're going to have political appointees as ambassador, I mean, you might take the view, well, they should all be non-political, but we have mostly political that some should come from the opposition. And I think it depends what you do with it. Now, on the second part of your question, well, are you representing the ANC? I never saw it like that. In fact, I never, and I will tell you that my staff was a, a very, very happy united team. And there were 27 of us in the embassy and only seven were South African, 20 were Argentine. And most of my colleagues, I never, we never had in my three years there, my South African colleagues, we had a lot to do with each other professionally and socially. I never asked them once, not a single time, who they voted for, and they obviously know who I voted for. And we managed to conduct the business of South Africa without ever having a party political discussion or disagreement. So I think there is a difference between the party interest and the national interest. And, you know, I was also offered another country to represent South Africa, and Portugal, in the EU. And I chose Argentina precisely because I thought, you know, apart from other factors, there's less controversy in the bilateral relationship. If I'd been the ambassador in an EU country where there are issues in contestation between them and us, then that might well have come to play. But I must say, in the actual relationship that I was in charge of, it didn't happen. So, and that's why I took the job and hopefully did it, you know, in, in a reasonable fashion, without, you know, surrendering my principles, because that was not in play or in prospect when I was there. Whether it could be done today, whether it would be done. You know, at the time I was appointed an ambassador by Jacob Zuma, he in the same month appointed Tuli Maronsela as a public protector. I'm not sure he's so happy about that appointment. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if she was ANC. Maybe she was. Okay, well, you know better than me. He also appointed, you know, a very independent-minded person. Jill Marcus, certainly ANC, very independent-minded. And, you know, not a camp follower of, of party instructions. And, you know, there were some other DA ambassadors, Sandra Buerta, Douglas Gibson, Sheila Cameron, all of whom were appointed before I was appointed. Yeah. So, anyway, look, it's a, it's a fair point, and uh, it is what it is. Uh, we have a question on the far side there, Hi. and then... And Hi, then Tony. Um, when Parliament reconvenes next week, it will look uh, very interesting, and, and you touched on the role of the opposition. There will be a number of new parties there, a couple of new faces, uh, and a, a new leader of the opposition as well. Do you have any words of advice to the new parties in Parliament uh, as they uh, settle into the opposition benches? Well, you know, because I'm now a diplomat or a detribalized diplomat, I've become much more diplomatic. So <laughs> among, among things I do, I write a weekly column in the business day and in, my new, in the new Leon, the less partisan, when I decide to award all three of the top parties an A or an A+, plus, the ANC for getting so many votes, the DA for getting so many new votes, and the EFF for doing so well. 
So I'll give, give yourselves an A, as the great Benjamin Zander would say, the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic. But I did point about the EFF, talking about the new kids on the block, that to adapt a phrase of Mario Cuomo, the one-time governor of New York, you campaign in poetry, but you legislate in prose. So I can tell you, having both been a campaigner and a legislator, that there's a hell of a difference between shouting on the rooftop and actually doing the graft in Parliament. And whether Mr. Malema and his 20 or 25 MPs have got the wherewithal, I'm not making any judgments, but it really is not glamorous work. And, you know, I, I, had the, uh, I had the privilege the other night of paying, saying farewell to a most distinguished, not always easy colleague of mine, Dean Smuts, who really was one of the great legislators produced by our little batch of seven MPs who left Parliament after our last 20 years, 25 years. But she was a real legislator. She could go into the intricacy. She would do the hours. She would, you know, burrow away and she could make changes. I'll tell you, there's some outstanding legislators in Parliament. One of them is Steve Swartz of the ACDP. Excellent legislator. But, and that's where he makes a mark. Now, what you've got to do in Parliament, now, you're a small party and the EFF small. They don't get so much air time, you know, and then so many times you can wear your red overalls and do all those things. That'll get a lot of attention. But it's what you do in the months and the years that follow. And we have a lot of instructive examples, Cope perhaps being the most extreme one, of, you know, starting with a big bang and then just becoming a, a damp squib, if I might mix my metaphors. So that would be the first thing, you know, just be prepared to do the graft. It's not all glamorous. And try and make a difference where you have to in Parliament. The second is to try and revive Parliament as an institution. I mean, you know, Frini Janwala said it very well on the 6th of December, the day after Mandela died. I was just waiting on the line for 7.02 to speak about Mandela. And she came on before me, our speaker in the first Parliament. And she said Mandela always wore a suit to Parliament. Didn't wear those famous shirts that Mr. Suharto gave him first, incidentally. More of that in the book. She said because he wanted to show his respect for Parliament. And Mandela's respect for Parliament was profound. I can't say that all his successes as president have been as respectful of Parliament's institution. And I certainly can tell you the opposition has contributed to the diminution of Parliament. And the very simple reason is, since not, you know, I made the point now, I made it in my book on the contrary, so I'm not talking out of school here, by the fact that the leader of the biggest opposition party chooses not to be in Parliament which has to be a diminution of the institution, because essentially the opposition, chief opposition, saying it doesn't actually matter that much, Parliament, you know, we'd rather govern a province or a city. And, and let me not detract for an iota from the great achievements of Hill and Zilla's governance in the city or the province. I think they're very good, and the electorate's spoken on that. But if you're serious about institution building, then actually the chief opposition leader should be in the fulcrum of that institution, which is Parliament. So I would, those would be some of my gratuitous words of advice and you know look it's very hard I mean I got elected to parliament and that old discredited regime which had one virtue I was the MP for Houghton the reason that Mandela asked me for dinner wasn't because I was pretty or articulate because I took a chocolate cake to him he'd moved into my constituency he didn't even have a vote showing you how old this was 1992 and he was very taken with the fact that he had as he put an energetic parliamentary representative well, there's no MP for Houghton or Seapoint or Google Ads or anywhere else because they get assigned by the party. And part of the diminution of parliament is, as you know, that there's no accountability directly between the people and their representatives. So, uh, you know all the plans that have been hatched and put on the table. That should also be given attention to. But in the absence of that, Martin, you know, the MP has got to go the extra mile because he doesn't automatically uh, have a direct connection with the people he or she represents. First of all, thank you very much for your highly entertaining presentation delivered with your usual style and panache. Thank you. What my main question is, all your four books always focus on events in the past. Mm. What happened before? No, we can't do anything about the past. Shouldn't we have more focus on the present moment? And what do you think should be done right now in South Africa to move forward? Thank you. Well, very good. Uh, the last chapter of my book looks forward. So let me leave it there. I, I do. And in the last chapter of my biography also looks forward. So I always try and leave the last chapter of saying where we are and where I think we could be going. So uh, it is in the book. But, you know, <coughs> the reason I write those books, you know, apart from wanting to get on the right side of history, I suppose, 
is that uh, there's a British historian, C.V. Wedgwood, who said, uh, history is written backward but lived forward. And nobody who knows the end of the story, or very few people, let me add, can know what, possibly know what it was like at the time. So what I try and do in these books is to describe what was going on. Obviously, from my point of view, because there are many other, I'm not saying they're wrong and I'm right or vice versa. But I do think there is a, there's a richness in, 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 in the recorded history if you were, as I said, happy, lucky enough just to have been around at the time and in those rooms when that history was being written. So that's why I write those books, but I always try at the end, if I haven't got it right, you can tell me, to actually look forward. Thanks. Um, two very short questions. Um, you, you spoke about Alan Ziller, that's the leader who's not in Parliament. Um, what's your take on the fact that the rising star in the DA used to be the leader in Parliament? The DA has done very well. She's going to go and study it at Harvard. Um, just what's your take on that? And then just tell us briefly a bit about your relationship uh, with um, Becky and Zuma. Thanks. Yeah. Well, there, there, that's in the book, uh, the Mbeki Zuma relationship. So, I, you know, Jeremy will get very upset if I tell you what's in the book because you won't go and buy it, you see, and that's the idea. <laughs> so I, I certainly deal with my relationship with Mbeki at some length because it was so different from my relationship with Mandela. And, you know, it, my relationship with Zuma when I had one because he actually became president after I left Parliament. He was the deputy president when I was in Parliament, was very warm. Maybe that's why he made me an ambassador. Because Jacob Zuma, whatever his other faults might be, is a very warm and engaging human being. And what really amazed me, let me give you one anecdote, which is in the book, is, you know, I had this rather cold war with Thabo and Becky when he was president, I was leader of the opposition. No doubt it takes two to tango, so, you know, I won't go into that. People can draw their own conclusions. But um, I, one stage, went to seek the counsel of Mandela, as he invited me to do on He'd long retired by three or four years. And he said to me, and I went to him, I said, well, you know, look, Madiba, you know, we had this very good, great relationship, and we could argue and then agree. And uh, Tito Mbawene, who's launching my book next week in Johannesburg, was the same chap. He, I was the spokesman on Labour's web. We'd had the most ferocious debates in Parliament. I disagreed with every piece of Labour legislation Tito passed, and we'd have dinner afterwards. And that was a sort of relationship, and it changed under the Mbeki administration. But um, so I said to Mandela, you know, oh, we had this good thing, and now, you know, Tabo is in charge, it's just terrible. And maybe, you know, how do we restore the, repair the breach? Because I think it's so good for the country that the leader of the opposition and the president don't speak to each other. So Mandela made some very interesting remarks about his relationship with Mbeki, which I will not tell you, because then you will not read the book, so I won't tell you. But what he did say in the conversation, he said to me, you know, Tony, you must go and seek the counsel of JZ. Of course, Jacob Zuma, who was in the deputy president, really was a figure who'd been pushed into the outer edges by the Mbeki guard. And I thought this old guy's really lost it, you know. Well, he obviously doesn't know what's going on. He said he's the real power in the party and in government. And, you know, there it happened. Four years later, Jacob Zuma beat Tabo Mbeki to become president of the ANC. So that was a very interesting insight, which I dismissed at the time, and doubtless others did as well, where Mandela knew where he spoke much more accurately than others did. On the, you know, look, I went to Harvard. It sounds like it happens when you, lead the, you finish being leader of the opposition, you go to Harvard. That's exactly what I did. I said, I went as a fellow, not as a student. So it was much easier. And John Kayser, who's here, went to Harvard, do the degree that Lindy was going. And David Mania was at Harvard when I was there. And I... So was Joel Pollack, my speechwriter, and I said, hell, we've got the government in exile here. I don't think Helen was delighted to hear about. But uh, now you could say there's a government in exile. No, but um, I don't know what, you know, the real reasons, the stated reasons. I think it's a pity because I think there's been a lot of turnover in the opposition leadership. I mean, the DAA, and therefore the official opposition, is now going to elect its fourth parliamentary leader in seven years. I left in as leader of the opposition in May 2007. I'd held that post since 1999. And no doubt, you know, to the relief of some, if not many. But since I left, then now we're on the eve of the fourth parliamentary leader. And I think that's too high a turnover rate in terms of stability and in terms of really impacting on the political process. Because you need time. You know, it, it, you probably need six months to just get your feet. And I had the advantage of having been in parliament for nearly five years before I became leader. And I understand Musi Maimani is going to be the leader, I'm told. 
you know, has not had one day's parliamentary experience. Now, experience isn't everything, but it's a factor. So, and I'm not talking as a DA aligned person historically, I'm talking just as a citizen, a small D Democrat. I think it's important that South Africa has leader of the opposition who establishes him or herself, goes the distance, and therefore um, can actually project strength on the opposition side. That would be my view. Just hold on up. We've got uh, under instructions to do two uh, to end at seven. Strict instructions. So there's two there's two final questions. Gentleman over there, and then the lady. You still want to ask a question? I'm sorry, we won't have we won't have time. Hi, right, Tony. Thanks for your time this evening. Um, sorry to ask you, but in a crystal ball, what's what do you think is going to happen in the next five, ten years? Oh, I know, I know, but I, I couldn't. You know, I'll do what the, one of my predecessors, Van Zell Slubbert, used to do. He said he would always duck the question. He said when he was in an aeroplane, it's more difficult because, you know, you <laughs> can't run away. He said he'd put up his hands and say, who knows? And, you know, without being facetious or flippant, who knows? I, I think we finally balanced. I mean, I think there are positives and negatives, and we must make sure there are more positive and negatives. I think a lot of South Africa shows resilience. Other parts of it show weakness. I tried just briefly to elaborate on both those areas in my remarks tonight. But it's not, you know, it's not a Ming vase that you put on the shelf. South Africa's democracy economy has got to be worked at and renewed and refreshed. And I would hope that uh, that happens in the next few years in all institutions. I'd hope that uh, the government lives up to its own state of commitments, the NDP. I mean, there's one of the signature tunes of the NDP is a cause for creating certainty for investors. Well, I can point to 12 bills that were passed last year which create uncertainty for investors. So you've actually got to join up your commitments with your acts across the board. It's not restricted government. I also think that we have, you know, this paradoxical country where some sectors perform extraordinarily well, some underperform extremely badly, and we've got to try and take the good performers into the bad performing areas, not the reverse, which is often the tendency. And we've got a very resilient people. Look, I mean, you know, I might tell you what my old acquaintance Steve Mulholland says, who still thunders away in the Sunday Times, was head of the Financial Mail in its glory days. He said, look, ever since I was five years old, I was always told South Africa had five years to go. Well, I'm now 85 and we're both still here. So, um, you know, there's, that is also true. So, you know, I wouldn't get too despondent, but I would be very vigilant because there are some orange lights flashing that we need to try and turn to green and not turn to red. Last question. Hi. Um, uh, how do you feel you've made a difference within the, greater, within the South African context as someone having been in politics? You know, if, this probably sounds a bit uh, vainglorious. I can only quote what uh, one of the President Roosevelt said. I don't remember if it was Theodore or FDR, but said... I did what I could with what I had from where I was. And that's really all you can do. So, you know, I was at a conference at Oxford the other day, happily two weekends ago, and normally I would have been campaigning, but this time I didn't have any, do any campaigning. Probably why the opposition did so well this time. I wasn't on the campaign trail. Anyway, um, so I was sitting at Oxford, and there was a very distinguished academic from Wits University, if I dare say it here, my, uh, w which I'm an alumnus, my second confession tonight. And uh, he gave me a long thing. He said, well, you know, when you were leader of the DP and the DA, you missed a historic moment because there were the whole black consciousness group and, and they were not really affiliated to the ANC and you could have, and he went to this whole very elaborate thesis that actually if you had a liberal prospect, there was a kind of historic moment. That, and I listened to all this. It was very well argued. And I looked at this guy, this academic. I said, look, it's fantastic. Here I am at Oxford two weekends to an election. This is just so much nicer, sitting in a seminar room at St. Anthony's College. But out there in the real world, you've got to have a pr sense of the environment you're in. So there are all kinds of, we can look back and say, well, if you'd done this, you could have done that. You, you've actually, without abandoning your core beliefs and your, hopefully your sense of mission integrity, you've got to work in the environment that you're in to make the changes that you want. So the environment that I occupied in politics, which ended in the formal sense in 2007, between 1989 and 2007, very different from the environment today. And I mean, one of the big differences, uh, the president of South Africa was called Nelson Mandela, which rather created 
a very different set of electoral, political, and a whole lot of other things than when the president's name is Jacob Zuma. And, but still, as I pointed out at the beginning, the opposition faces the conundrum that in 2014, as in 1994, it's still hitting its head against a 38% total vote for all the opposition forces in the country. And that has not changed at all. So there are certain objective realities and constraints. You've got to push the envelope, I think, as much as you can. You've got to do what you can. You've got to work hard. And you've got to maintain your sense of self-belief and integrity. And, you know, I, if I can leave you with one thought without sounding too, and I mentioned a bad Israeli president who um, landed up in jail called Mr. Moshe Katsef, who's not to be emulated, let me say, in any respect. But the current president of Israel is a chap called Shimon Peres, who's 91 years old, unbelievable, very articulate, and, and, and a dove. I mean, in a country of hawks, he's a, you know, more on the peace side. Anyway, I went along 11 years ago to his 80th birthday. And this guy was like the all-time loser of Israeli politics, which is even you know, more brutal than South African politics. And he couldn't ever be elected prime minister. He, he was always, you know, just always the bridesmaid, never the bride. And he made a most unbelievable speech, and, and he stood there, and Clinton was there, and F.W. de Klerk was there, and Butelezi was there, and Gorbachev was there, the whole world. And he said, you know, people ask me how I go on. And he said, I'll tell you how I go on. He said, if you put yourself in a cause that is greater than yourself, you can always achieve great things. If you only for yourself, you'll only achieve small things. So that was a nice little political epitaph, and you know, Four years later, he was elected president of his country. So, you know, I, I think there's an inspiration, not, and please ignore the, the national identity, I think just in that long and usefully lived life, there is an inspiration that you've got to stick to the ones, you know, you know I, I see these people, they cross the floor, they move about, they look at politics as a sort of a work-seeking opportunity. Now, doubtless it has become that in many cases, but I still think, you know, there is that idea of conscientious public service, of having a set of beliefs and sticking to them, even though the weather sometimes seems bad. And I think then the weather does change, as, as indeed we saw last Wednesday. Would you like to say the final words? Well, I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you to our speaker. If I can have a round of applause. <laughs>